Alright, obviously this first video is going to be about Team Ruby. Ruby, Weiss, Blake... Would you take a look at that? Pretty pathetic, huh? And now I bet you wouldn't believe that that guy, he once thought he knew what he was talking about. He once thought that that was probably his magnum opus in video making. <laughs> tisk tisk tisk. He was but a young, young lad back then. So now what do we do? Well, my friends, we're going to go back, and we're going to talk once again about the main characters of Ruby, and what better way to start out than with our silver-eyed protege protagonist, Ruby Rose. In YouTube land, Jake of the One Man Band is back again, bringing you guys a Ruby character breakdown. That is correct, it is a character breakdown. Why is it a character breakdown instead of a team breakdown? Because I'm lazy. And if I was actually going to do a team breakdown, I thought about it, it would probably be about an hour long, or something along those lines, to the fact that I didn't want to make that long of a video. So, this way, I'm going to talk about each character individually, so I can just concentrate on that one character. So, I think in the long run, it'll be better. And so, here we are, talking about the main characters of Ruby. And now we are talking about Ruby Rose herself. As we all know, Ruby is a protege when it comes to fighting creatures of Grimm. She was taken under her Uncle Crow's wing and taught the way of the Scythe. And it is then she created her weapon, Crescent Rose, which is a combination of a collapsible scythe and a collapsible high-impact sniper rifle. Meaning... It's also a gun. We all know this. So, how does she fight with this Crescent Rose? Well, we see that she not only uses the momentum of her discharges from the rifle to help propel herself to her enemies, but she also uses the momentum to help swing the scythe in very long, arcing attacks. But she's still able to do quick flip-arounds and quick attacks to take out uh, multiple enemies in front of her and all around her. She's a very, very effective area of effect fighter. She's able to take on many, many enemies. She's actually very good at this. During the red trailer, Ruby Rose fights an entire pack of Beowulfs and barely breaks a sweat. She's able to take on dozens of creatures of Grimm at the same time and take them out with ease, taking no damage whatsoever. And with the combination of her sniper rifle scythe and her semblance, which is speed, she's able to take out these enemies quickly. That way, she's very effective at fighting lots of enemies. But on the downside, when it comes to bigger, singular enemies, she has trouble. Her weapon lacks the initial punch to break through a Deathstalker's armor. And when it comes to fighting giant Nevermores, she isn't able to reach them unless she has help from her team. So even though she's a very good fighter against multiple enemies, when it comes to big, heavily armored enemies, she may run into trouble. And that's why her whole solo player act had to come to an end. Let me talk about the fighting stats for a second. Now, I've broken down the whole Ruby Universe's fighting stats into four categories, and that is speed, strength, agility, and dust. Dust meaning, like, the ability to control dust, kind of like the whole magic concept. With Ruby, we know that she is the fastest member of her team, and due to both her speed and the inertia that her Crescent Rose creates, she is also very agile. And we can also conclude that her lugging around that giant scythe and swinging it around would make her pretty dang strong. But it is due to that fact that I think she kind of lacks in the fact of dust capabilities. Sure, she uses dust attacks with um, bullets and stuff, 
but really it isn't all that effective when you think of Weiss or Yang or Blake even, who all can use dust to a more higher extent than Ruby can. All in all, Ruby's fighting style is purely based on speed and agility. Much like the Bloodborne Hunters, she is meant to deal a lot of damage and then get out of the way. She is not supposed to soak up damage. She is supposed to get in there, do an attack, and get away before an enemy has a chance to strike at her, because she does not have that much protection. As we saw from Volume 1, Ruby is a bit socially awkward character that has a solo player complex. And I know that because I have the same exact complex. It's where you don't truly feel like you can rely on other people, so you rely only on yourself. Thus, you become a solo player. She states this pretty much when she tells Yang that she doesn't have to make friends. Now, that may have just been due to her social awkwardness and her inability to really make friends easily, but due to the fact that she was a protege at Signal Academy and was taken under her Uncle Crow's wing, probably at a very young age, may have given her a bit of superiority complex when it comes to fighting monsters. She had the innate ability to be a great huntsman, but not a good team player, if you will. That's when she finally went to Beacon Academy, she was going to have to learn to be a team player. Now even though she had the solo player mentality, she was still going to give the whole teammate thing the good college try. As we saw when she uh, got in contact with Weiss in the Emerald Forest, it was Weiss that first discarded her, and Ruby stated that they were supposed to be teammates. But it wasn't until they finally got into combat with the Creatures of Grimm that Ruby once again got into her solo act. She didn't see what Weiss is doing. She didn't communicate well. She just sprang right into the fight, not really caring about Weiss's safety or what Weiss was going to do. It wasn't until she came across an enemy that she could not defeat by herself that she learned the importance of a team. And that was when... Uh, Team Ruby and Team Juniper were fighting the giant Nevermore and giant Deathstalker. She then saw that she would have to work together with these other people in order to take these creatures down. Thus, I think, probably brought out the most powerful side of her. As we all know from other anime, you are only truly strong when you fight for others. If you're fighting for yourself, you will never exceed those who fight for others. A Vegeta complex, if you will. Wow, Ruby is sort of like Vegeta. Well, at one point. That's a very interesting thought. Now, even though Ruby was able to calculate a plan to kill the giant Nevermore, she never was a truly great leader in Volume 1. She was a competent leader. She was still faltering, as we saw in the next few episodes, how she had a tussle with Weiss once again how she wasn't living up really to Weiss's standards of being a leader, and she then realized that she had to be a more responsible type character. But once we roll into Volume 2 of Ruby, we see Ruby has really come into fruition in being a leader. She is now a great leader due to the fact on how she takes in a battle, she forms strategies, and she calls out special attacks for her teammates while they are fighting. This is shown when they are fighting Torchwick in the giant paladin Mexu, how she lists off attacks such as Checkmate, Bumblebee, Ice Flower, and the, and the such. She's, they were able to calculate those attacks, and she is able to discern when the correct time is to use them. It's also during Volume 2 that we see that she's been able to make friends easier. But we never truly see her make any new friends, if you will. Unless if you count Neptune. But we do see that she still retains her social awkwardness, as we see at a dance. Mostly shown by John how he actually states to the socially awkward, to which he and Ruby have a toast to. And it is during the dance that she can't really walk in high heels, but then again, who really can? And she states that she wishes to put her hood back on. 
Now, here's, here's an interesting concept about the hood. She always wears it. The only time that we haven't seen her wear it is one, when she is sleeping, and two, when she is at the dance. Now, obviously this hood holds some form of importance to her. I believe that this hood was created by her mother, and so she feels protected while in the hood. She's able to shroud herself in her mother's protection. And she's, when she pulls up the hood, you know, she feels safe. And she feels like she can take on anything, much like her mother did when she was still alive, due to her mother being one of the best huntsmen there was. Not only does Ruby detain her slight social awkwardness, but she is still the energetic and innocent girl that she was in Volume 1. It is, Ruby is truly the embodiment of innocence in this world, as she is very ignorant due to the fact that she has a very small but pretty forward concept on how she wants to live her life. I believe Ruby still sees things in a very black and white scale, how there is good and bad and nothing in between, while the rest of Team Ruby has kind of seen the world in more of a gray scale. Ruby has yet to meet the grayscale standards. But it is also in Volume 2 that we see Ruby probably isn't the most tactful or intelligent person. Now even though she is a good leader and she can lead her team practically into anything, when she goes off with Ublik and she sees the giant Goliath Grimms, her first real reaction to them was, Let's kill it. Like we can actually accomplish that. And it's Ublik who has to explain to her that that's a bad idea. So, once again, going back to the whole white and black way of thinking that Ruby has. She sees a grim creature and she wants to go kill it, no matter what. Instead of taking some time to think, well, why aren't they attacking humanity? Why are they just patrolling? How did they get that big? How am I going to take something like that down? And, well, Ruby, you're no Legolas. You're not gonna take down a giant Oliphant all by yourself. But thankfully, Ublik is there to give her a bit of advice and wisdom so that she would probably bring that into her leadership role and help become smarter and a more tactful leader. And really, to be honest, about Ruby with these first two volumes, she's probably the most bland of all the members of Team Ruby. Now let me explain. Ruby is the main character. I understand that. So she's supposed to be the focal point. She's supposed to be that one character that the entire audience can really get attached to and sort of project themselves onto. This young, innocent girl who just wants to do the right thing and is learning and growing during this time. She isn't as established as the rest of the members of Team Ruby, but she is the character who I believe has had the least amount of character development out of the main characters, I mean. As we see, really the most character development we've seen from her is she's been able to make friends, but that was really achieved off screen. We saw her make friends with Weiss and Blake pretty much, but really how did she get to know the rest of Team Juniper? How did she get to know Sunwell? How did she get to know like Team Coffee Well? That was all done between the times of Volume 1 and Volume 2. So, really, we haven't witnessed much of her character development. She stayed mostly the same through these two volumes. And that's why I believe she's a very sort of bland character. She isn't really all that interesting. Because when a character develops and when a character grows, that's what makes us think about them. When we see a character is going through hard times, we feel for them and we want them to get through those hard times. Much like Blake or Weiss or Yang, how they talk about their problems and their pasts. With Ruby, she hasn't really talked about her past that much. She has barely talked about the future and she hasn't really grown really as a character to become someone better. Now maybe she's just that MacGuffin character who's, she's the best she can be at this point. And maybe she may never change, but I still think that at least a little bit of growth is needed to keep Ruby 
sort of in that main character persona to where we're always thinking about Ruby and we're always wanting to know what's gonna happen with her instead of thinking about what's gonna happen with Yang or John or Ren for Pete's sake. Now I'm hoping in volume 3 that Ruby at least grows a little bit more personality wise and we get to learn a little bit more about her how we have a little bit more of character development with her that's what I'm hoping the rest of team Ruby has had character development both in volume 1 and volume 2 especially in volume 2 with the rest of team Ruby the only member of team Ruby that didn't really grow in volume 2 was Ruby so at the end of the day Ruby Rose is the character that a newcomer to the show Ruby can project themselves upon. They can see why people love this girl and why she is the main character. And once they get into the later volumes, they can see how she could probably develop as a character and become even better. And I'm hoping that in the future volumes, they continue to grow Ruby as both a character and as a person. Hey, hey everybody out there again it's the end slate so I hope you guys enjoyed this video uh, I hope it's better than the last team Ruby breakdown that I did it's probably more entertaining I mean I hope it is so I hope you guys enjoyed once again so keep a lookout for when I start to do the other members of team Ruby and then after that team Juniper so you think I missed something about Ruby do you got something to add do you have a different opinion? Leave it down in the comments below. I would love to read them. And remember, these are really all my opinions, my observations. You guys can see something else, maybe that I can't. So we all have to do have a part in this together to help learn who these characters are so we can get ready for volume three. So in the meantime, be a good person, tip your waitresses, keep moving forward, and be sure to check out some other videos that I've done. I do a lot of them to keep you entertained. So I'll see you guys next time I'm out there in YouTube land. Yeah, yeah.